Now on to um, perhaps one of the most spectacular stories in my entire career in journalism. How was this book made possible and what is this autism miracle? We send our team to sit down with J.B. Hanley and start explaining what's going on. Something fascinating is happening. Jamie developed normally until about 15 months and then he had a real regression. And Jamie went from talking and doing normal things to very unusual mannerisms. He stopped talking, he started spinning around in circles and running along walls in funny patterns. So we knew that something was seriously, seriously wrong. And at 18 months of age, Jamie was diagnosed with autism. As he got older, those mannerisms got worse because aggression and frustration started to be baked into his day. He's severely disabled. He is unable to speak, but for a handful of words. Fancy, fancy. It's a 24 seven job. Just going through a normal day, we were left to guess about everything. You know, we could walk into Chipotle and I wouldn't know what he wanted. I would just guess what he seemed to like. We had to guess how he was feeling, how he wanted to spend his time, when he became frustrated, he couldn't answer if we said, was it this, was it that? And so just getting through a day was a ton of guesswork and walking on eggshells that something doesn't set him off. He would go into what felt like almost a trance of aggression and anxiety where he would stomp up and down, hit himself in the head. When Jamie was 13, Lisa and I were out to dinner and uh, we came back and the babysitter explained that um, Jamie had just had a huge outburst on the couch and by the time she got there he was already aggressively hitting himself in his forehead with the back of his hand and I was pretty sure that he had broken it and you know I had to rush him to the hospital to make sure and the whole time I'm driving I'm thinking what's this going to look like when he's 35? Is this what life is going to be like and is this just going to get worse and what does worse look like from here? Over the years, we've tried everything in biomedical from like the most mainstream to the most like hippie and crunchy idea. Anything that might help Jamie, we've given a try to. The truth was none of that had allowed him to get his communication back or his speech back. It was starting to feel super dark. Like, where is this all going? And it was really, really hard to think about. I get a text from Honey Rinicella She's this mom who I describe as like an autism pen pal. She has two sons on the spectrum. You know, many of us share ideas about how to help our kids. And she said something to the effect of, you will not believe all the things that Vince is saying. And that didn't even make sense to me because he's a non-speaker just like Jamie. And she's basically explains to me that four months ago, we thought the height of Vince's cognition was, I want juice. And we started this thing called spelling to communicate and now he's cranking out these sophisticated paragraphs. She was bridging just enough to be willing to say to myself, fine, fine, we'll give this a try. Hope is a super dangerous drug. As you get older and as your child gets older, you're just less willing to be let down one more time by one new treatment or one new idea. You're just fried out on the notion of hope and the hangover from hope it just can be really brutal. I think I had all but given up on Jamie's situation improving. I had no idea what was about to happen and how good things were about to get. All right, so let's just spell a couple words really quick. Let's spell, even though we started with a wide open already, let's spell routine. R O U T I N N E. Beautiful. Nice job. What holds you back from trying new things, if anything? D and E and F and I N I T and Definitely F and E and A, F 
fear, O and, of, M and, E and, L and, T and, I and, G melting, D, O, W melting down. You're told this is a terrible thing that happened to your kid. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry your kid has autism. But we're learning that autism is more likely a sensory motor processing disorder than anything else. We're seeing that when we address the sensory and motor differences of non-speakers, they're capable of things that nobody realized they were capable of. Changing everything about how we teach and raise children with autism. Great job. Maddie, I'm really proud of you. I'm an S2C practitioner, which means spelling to communicate. Basically, I teach non-speaking people to point to letters on a letter board as a means of communication. We call it the brain-body disconnect, apraxia. That's layman's terms for apraxia. We had to help them connect their brain to their body. So these behaviors become more under their purposeful motor control instead of impulsive or reflexive or just happening sort of automatically. The set of three stencils that we start most spellers on, where the alphabet is broken out into nine letters. And when we're spelling with them, we're teaching them to hold the pencil and just poke in and out of the letter. And it involves a lot of prompting when kids are first learning how to do it. As they get more and more accurate, we take the flap off, we work on the field of nine. This is the next stage where spellers are now spelling on a board that has all 26 letters, but still with the support, the proprioceptive support of feeling the pencil go through the letters while they poke. So the method is not about tracing the letters. In fact, kids might try to do that. It's literally, we want the same motion every single time. It's just in and out, poke, in and out, poke. We're trying to myelinate this one neural pathway of just in and out, poke. That's how you choose the letters. And once you're really accurate on here and you've started answering open-ended questions because with 26 letters, you can spell anything, then you can graduate to a laminated letter board, which has less sensory feedback. Now we're getting more to like, you know, an LCD screen would have where You've myelinated this motor plan of lifting and poking and moving your eyes fluidly across the board and you simply have to touch this bottom here and we know that you want us to flip the board around for you to hit numbers or ABC and we flip back to the alphabet board. Once they're um, basically ready to move on to typing because they've mastered the laminated letter board, I hold it just like a letter board. Instead of me being the feedback loop, we are using a program that whatever they type and spell, the letters show up there and they learn to look back and forth between what they're spelling and let's just say the keyboard and then it has a voice output element. Maddie, you have such great technique and you've just newly been spelling openly. How has that been for you for the past few months? What's that been like? I T H A it has C H A N G E D it has changed E V I E R Y every T H I N it has changed everything. These kids are brilliant. Their minds are amazing. And because now we can understand them, because they can communicate with us in a way that we understand, suddenly it just doesn't feel like it's us and them. We just had to find a way that we could all understand each other. And I think S2C has the power to create that synergy and to change the lives of millions of non-speakers. And amazingly, just one year ago, essentially, Jameson went to his first class with Spelling to Communicate, trying to learn how to put a stencil through these letters. And now he is the co-author on a book. Get ready for this. JB, Jamie, I want to thank you for inviting me into your home. It's our uh, pleasure. It's really great to be here. Obviously, you know, we're all, I, I, I read this book. I've, it, 
is one of the most amazing books I've ever read. And I, I really mean that. I've never thought more about how I think, what makes me who I am, and my own children. You know, how are we communicating? And there's just something really profound about this book. JB, to start with you, which is sort of how the book works. We start with you and then we get to journey into uh, Jamie's experience. As you were going to this first meeting, this S2C, what was your perspective of you know, where Jamie's learning was at? You'd had him in school. So if you were going to describe him at that moment, what were you thinking his education level was at or if someone had asked you? I, I, I think we didn't know. I really didn't know. We measured his cognition by his words. And on that measure, there weren't a lot of words and there therefore wasn't a lot of cognition. That was kind of the giant, giant mistake that we made. And so when Honey called me and she presented this alternative view, I think I fell into a state of cognitive dissonance. There was a part of me that had always known that he seemed to understand just about everything I said to him. Okay. And so there was a plausibility to what she was saying, but at the same time, I mean, are you kidding me? He's been there the whole time. He can spell. He's academically on the same level as peers, if not like way above. That was a lot to take on. And so I would say that I didn't intellectually think it was possible, but somewhere deep in my soul, I thought, wow, maybe, maybe. And it's interesting, Dell. I talk to parents Many are in the camp of, well, my kid can't spell, so how could they do this? And I understand that camp. Mm -hmm. I was largely in that camp. Some get it immediately, and they go, yeah, I always knew that. I knew they just needed to find a way. They kind of, it just immediately lines up for them perfectly. They've known in their heart how brilliant their kid is. I was somewhere in between, okay. and so it was a real struggle. It's a real struggle of, of hope, denial, fear, and everything else. <laughs> All right, Jamie, um, first of all, thank you. I remember meeting you just about, I guess it would be five years ago now when we now. were coming through <laughs> with Vaxxed and we took a tour of your school. It was a very memorable, beautiful school. But I want to ask you, as you were walking up for that first S2C meeting, were you aware of what was happening there, or did you know why you were going there? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You got it. You got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I knew my life would change. Wow. It's not like we weren't talking about it in front so, of us. Right, so you're you know talking I mean? about it, you're having the conversations. I'm sure you're talking to him, like, we're going to do this thing. We're, we're totally. going to go check it out. Totally. He's getting on a plane and flying to Virginia. There's a whole explanation as to why. So he was walking into that place with all the same information I had about what might, what might happen. Jamie, so you've spent 17 years being able to understand everything happening around you. And this was, thought was, someone is going to finally help my parents understand exactly where I'm at. Was that sort of what you were thinking? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got it. Find it. You got it. 
You're right there. Mm -hmm. There you go. I know your eyes. Yes, it meant freedom. Okay. Wow. I think that it was, it was so extraordinary um, to walk in there to Growing Kids Therapy Center in Virginia mm -hmm. and you know, Elizabeth Vossler greets Jamie directly, right? I'm like background material for her. Hey, Jamie, how are right. you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And she literally sits down in a chair. She's sitting next to him just like I am now. And she says, says Jamie, I know how smart you are. No one had ever, had ever said that to him before. What did those words feel like? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. You got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're doing great. I wondered how she knew. Wow. I right. think we all wonder that, right? Yeah. yeah. How does she know? And, and the first time I heard him tell me that, because he's given me that sort of explanation in different ways, it made me really sad because I thought he's been so alone with this information. Yeah. Right? The fact that he thought, how does she know? Like, it's been my secret that I've had to bear. Finally, somebody who understands. And it was beautiful that she understood and that she was creating this opening for him. And it was tragic to imagine that he'd had to face that right. by himself. Right. Because it was such a surprise to him. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me just sort of, in, in reading about this, my understanding is that in non-speakers, there is, the brain is fully able to hear, to form thoughts, produce the language that would produce words, but the act of actually making your mouth say words or type things out on, like, that that's a fine motor skill versus sort of a gross, larger muscle motor skill. I think the simplest way to describe it is somewhere between normal and stratospherically intelligent with a motor impairment. Okay. And so it feels like it's more common that the real challenge is in fine, but the challenge is absolutely in all motor, okay? In all motor. Absolutely, okay. Okay. absolutely. Um, typical terms that you would hear these kids describe would be, my body is not my friend. Okay. Um, I can't get my body to do what I want. Uh -huh. I can't get myself to move. Initiation is a real challenge is in the motor requirement of initiation. So we're doing a lot of initiation therapy. Just trying to get your body to go grab an object is a lot harder than you might think for someone like Jamie. And so that motor impairment is a part of their life in every aspect, but certainly it becomes real problematic in communication. And one of the things that Elizabeth Vossler showed us sort of with a brain map is that the fine motor and the communication are kind of layered on top of each other. And so pressuring one makes it much harder to do the other, right? Yep. Whereas when you take a step back to gross motor, for whatever reason, once that pathway is developed, it flows out. So they, they present a pretty plausible explanation for how this works. Um, I think one of, the, one of the amazing things that I've learned, one of the millions of things that have turned everything upside down is never read body language of a non-speaker. We all do that, right? We all read body language. And a non-speaker can be staring at the wall, playing with a ball, picking their nose, whatever else, and they're listening to you perfectly. Right. They don't need to be like, look me in the eye. You know, that right. doesn't need to happen with them. Or they could be generating a lot of movement, which is typically used to help regulate. Uh -huh. They don't need you to calm them down. They're just doing their thing. <laughs> Meanwhile, the brain is completely active and observant. Elizabeth Vossler has said like, these are the most observant people in the world. They can't get out what they want, and so they absorb everything around them. That makes sense. Yeah. 
So Jamie, when you first started this process using the first letter board where you're pushing this pencil through the letters themselves, was that process, did it make sense? Or did you think this, this doesn't make sense? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I got it right away. He says, Yes, I got it right away. So this is an important concept for people to understand. The cognition's already there. Right. What's not there is the pathway to the arm out to the board. It's like a stroke victim. And so the repetition is being done to create like a new neural map in the brain to kind of allow this process of communication to actually take place. Many times these kids have ocular apraxia what that means is, it's actually, so this is a sort of intermediate board, right, before the advanced keyboard. It's very hard for Jamie to get from X to C, because he has to deliberately choose to move his eyes up there, and with his motor impairment, that is not very easy to do. And so, one of the, th one of the processes that Jamie was going through while learning to move his arm the right way was just all this ocular work to kind of overcome the motor challenges from his eyes even moving. And, I've seen kids who can't get across the board, and so until they're able to do that, how can they use the board to spell, right? And so you can imagine how many ways that motor impairment can be misinterpreted by people yeah. to think that there's a cognitive impairment, right? Because they're, they're asking kids to do things that they literally can't make their body do, and so the determination is they don't understand me, right? right? You can see how a well-intended right. person could start to go down that path and think, well, I asked him to pick up the blue marble and he just sat there. Guess what? We now know, like, because of Jamie, he could be trying so hard to pick up that blue marble and not being able to make his body do what he wanted it to do. Can you imagine the frustration? Because then the teacher concludes, he doesn't understand me. Or I suppose even worse, he's defying me. I mean, I would oh. say there's lots of teachers that are, probably don't have the patience. There are so many ways, in my opinion, that we have misinterpreted these kids to their great detriment and frustration. And it's torturous when you start to go down that path and think about the scale of misunderstanding that's taking place. It's why the S2C community is so beautiful. They're really putting, someone's got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> he goes on his terms at his time. <laughs> yeah, we all should. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. He'll be back. <laughs> yeah. The moment it becomes clear to you that Jamie is all there and everything that's ever happened has been recorded. I'm, I try to imagine what that would be like to think your mind first goes to the celebration of that. Then there must just be, oh my God, my, my bad days, those moments, my frustrated moments, how many of those times was, did I maybe not hide it as well. I mean, look, we all do that with, with our fully functioning children, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Did you, or it, is there moments like that where? So there, there really was like a moment and maybe it was like a 48 hour span where I became like certain that this was really, this was real. And this was like gonna be our new life where we, Jamie's all there and we're gonna have access to him permanently. Like I really did start to internalize that yeah. over like a two day period because the evidence just was so compelling. He just, he just all of a sudden was like spelling everything right to the point that you couldn't deny it anymore. Dad was there with me. It's like, dad, am I really seeing this? Help me. You know, like I literally needed to get reinforced by him. And at that point, I, I would say it was 98% euphoria okay. and 2% pain. But I, I want to be clear about the pain. The pain wasn't like, oh, did I curse in front of Jamie one time and shouldn't have done that or, no. I mean, you know, I, I, tr I, I think like I'm pretty much the same around all three of my kids, right? So we have our moments. Okay, I can accept that, I'm a parent. 
the pain was his experience. The pain was starting to think about all those times I picked him up from school after the self-injury event and realizing now what the experience must have been like for him. All those moments of him somehow finding, keeping his sanity as the world around him must have seemed so insane, sitting on this dark secret. That's where the pain really is. The pain isn't my own behavior. The pain is his experience, right? That's what right. really hurts. It, it still hurts. It still, we, I still come around to it. I'd say there's, there's some parental guilt for not figuring it out sooner. But honestly, I get past that. I, I say... I mean, like if anybody, I think, can at least look at their life and say, man, I was freaking trying. I mean... You know what I mean? And, and, and most, you, I think many... At some point, you go there, right? right? I mean, we all right. have our own right. internal sure. metric that matters way more than anybody else's. And mine is, whatever, a pretty high standard to be a good dad. Um, I do get past that because I do know in my heart that I've been trying. Yeah. But the much harder one is the years that he had to endure. Because my life has been fine, relatively speaking. I'm fine, right? You know, I can walk and talk and do all the things I need to do. I've been able to love and have a family and right. have success. And like, I'm fine, right? Like, if I go tomorrow, I'm good. For him to have to endure that for all those years, that was has always been the hardest part of the whole thing. Is there any part for you specifically, because you, I mean, have been so invested, not only in your own story, this experience, Generation Rescue, creating spaces, working with Jen McCarthy. I mean, you have really tried to help the entire community. Everywhere there was any glimmer of hope, you sort of led the way down those corridors. Is there any frustration because it seems so simple? Like, I mean, it was so close. It was just like an arm movement. All I ever had to do as I was running around was figure out, I just need him to reach out, teach him to reach out and start with letters is there it's it's like that veil was so much thinner i think than anyone who had been aware and realizes um i mean that's such a good question i mean and, and only someone like you who's been in the community could come up with that there's great irony to what you're saying um i also think what's really been interesting for me the biomed community of autism parents, of which I'm a proud member, and of which many of your viewers belong, yeah. has been a much smaller portion of the population who's tried S2C. And in a way, we've sort of been looking for a magic intervention that's gonna bring our kids back to normal, right? Mm -hmm. And this simple little method of communication almost seemed too good to be true. So there was great irony that I'd spent years banging my head against the wall to try every biomed thing that was safe with Jamie. And yet in two and a half months spending less than two grand, a simple little educational intervention has changed our whole world and turned it upside down. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've noted the irony in all of that. And I think more importantly, I would say to the biomed parents who are out there listening, I really think that the biomed helped Jamie be a lot more regulated. You just got to witness him yeah. sitting in a chair for a long period of time, calm and happy. I see that with a lot of the biomed kids that maybe I don't see elsewhere. And so in a way, it prepared him for this moment to be able to do this. Um, but at the end of the day, whereas I thought biomed would allow Jamie to start talking like a normal person, I now accept that there's a motor impairment and maybe there's a way down the road to help address that more. But this basically just bypassed what I think is Jamie's primary disability and is now allowing him to lead a normal life. So there is great irony. <laughs> I do smile about it sometimes. And at the end of the day, Dell, I just thank God that I'm here. Yeah. For whatever the path was that got me to this point, anybody in my shoes knows to have my son back, to know what his dreams are, to simply be in a support role with Jamie on his path to life, is the gift I never thought I'd get. Mm -hmm. I'd accept that I wouldn't. And so to have it, you know, history is history, man. All we got is tomorrow, right? Yeah. Like, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. It's been, a, it's been a circuitous path that I never could have guessed. I'd probably do some things differently. I wish I'd met Elizabeth about five years ago. Hey, man, it's all good. Yeah. Here we are. First S2C lesson happens in December of... 2019. 2019. The first moment, what they call open. Describe for me what open 
more opening, how, what is that term? Yeah, what is it? open communication. Okay. So when you first start practicing S2C, you're really just trying to myelinate a pathway between the brain and the arm, and you use what are known as known words. Please spell Texas. Please spell Del Big Tree, right? Just spell words. Um, at some point in that process, you actually ask the child for their own opinion about a topic. <laughs> That's open communication. They're no longer just doing some sort of rote request. They're literally speaking their own mind. That is the magic threshold. That, like that's, that, the, that's the big, that's the moment you're dreaming about. That is the moment you're dreaming about. Yeah. That's the moment you never forget. That's the moment where you're in, in a state of disbelief. Okay. We're gonna do it, bud. I'm gonna tell your mom something. Here's the back. <laughs> Hold on, don't look at her while you do it though. That's better. There we go. M and O and. Mm hmm. Mom. I'm going to write every word, okay? Mom. <laughs> Good. Now look with your eyes. L and O and. Move your eyes. R. Key. So pull your hand back. L O V and. Move your eyes. Good looking. I love. You know what, can I turn, I'm going to make this beep, just because I know it's a little distracting. We're not done though. But I love, let's finish this thought first. Y and O and, now where's the next letter? So don't do that. I mean, move your eyes. There it is. I love you. Yeah. I love you too, Brogdon. <laughs> I love you. You're okay, I love you. T O two. T, keep going. H. So pokes like you mean it, right? So here, sit in the chair. Don't worry about them. So start T. T and H and E to the M and O and. Keep going. I, I'm with you. I love you to the M O. Lean back in your chair. M O O. Keep going, mean it. Moon to the moon. I love you to the moon. That's cool. Go ahead. You gotta put the ones you want. Go ahead. A, that's nice. And that's confident. And that's confident. Get it? C and keep going. B and keep going. That was good. A and C, I can tell the difference. C and keep going. So close, but you looked at me. So there you go. You're looking at me. I want you to look at the board. Okay. To the moon and back. Mom, I love you. To the moon and back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love you too, I can love you so much. T and H and what makes sense? A, that makes sense. And and move your arm and your eyes. Move your arm and your eyes. Thank and thanks, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yes, look at that. F and look at that travel. O and four. Thanks for. Thanks for. A L. G, keep going, don't worry about it, just find it with your eyes. So here, when you need that, pull back, look at the board, you're looking at me. You're still looking at me, so look at the, there you go, you had it. For all, oh, sorry, hon. Thanks for all. All what? T, N, don't worry, you weren't looking, so you got get it. H, keep looking. All the, thanks for all the. All the what? All the what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you waited a long time to say this, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Thanks for all the R and M and L. Oh, too many letters. Ready? All the what? S and move your eyes. A and move your eyes. C and move your eyes. R and shift them. 
I and F and shift them. I and C and keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. E and thanks for all the sacrifices. That was perfect. Mm -hmm. Love you. Never a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Love you, honey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're so good, dude. Okay. I, L, M, keep going. L, oh, you want an aisle. Aisle, okay. M, and, move your eyes. A, and, move your eyes. K, and, probably not. Oh, that doesn't make sense. You're looking at me. So go from K to the letter you want on this side. I'll make, I'll make, I'll make what? Hold on, whoa, whoa, you're, you're poking. I'll make Y, O, where are you going now? I think that's a big reach. I'll make you, mm -hmm. P and R and, keep going, O and, I know what you're spelling now. Go ahead, get it though. Don't look at me, look down. What comes after O? Probably not B. U and where's the last letter now? Move those eyes. Is it D? So spell that word for me again. P R O. Go back. Go back. U. Look at the board. And D. I'll make you proud. Already proud. Okay. Here. You already make me proud. Look at that smile. Amazing. Wow! Even for the S2C practitioners, they say that's like that for their job to be in a room with a family when that moment takes place is something that's always magical and amazing. Yeah. What was that moment? Do you remember yeah. that oh, moment? I, I mean, of course, I remember that moment. So we were doing a we were doing a lesson about the Boston Red Sox, and um, it was about the 2006 team that won the World Series for the first time in 80 years, and. Jamie spelling Fenway Park and Jacoby Ellsbury and all these words from the lesson. I am a diehard Yankee fan. <laughs> like, not a half ass Yankee, a diehard Yankee fan. So I'm sort of suffering through this lesson, and it turns out his practitioner is from Boston. And um, we get to the end of the lesson, and his practitioner, whose name is Dawn Marie, she asked Jamie, Jamie, what did you think of this lesson? And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a, that's a question that doesn't have an obvious answer. Why is she doing so this? Prior to that, questions were just things from that he could just Jimmy, who did the Reds, up. Where do the Red Sox play? Fenway, Fenway Park. Park. Got it's it. It's in the lesson. Known answer. That's an open question. It's a high risk So question. there's cognitive learning going on and, and repeating things that were learned in the lesson, but yeah. not one's own opinion feel? or feeling. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. And so, Jamie, so she says to Jamie, what did you think of that lesson? And Jamie spells, the Sox won, but the Yankees are champs in my family. <laughs> I mean, how could I ever forget that moment? I mean, my dad was in the room, who's also a Yankee fan and from New York. I couldn't even look at him because I knew we would have both been just dead. I mean, I, as I watched him spell that and I started to realize what he was spelling and saying, it was like the moment when like cognitive dissonance like goes away and like everything lines up and it's like, it's true. What Honey Rinicella told me is true. What Elizabeth Vossler told me is true. What they've all been saying is true. He's been here the whole time. He's tracked everything. I mean, the Sox won, but the Yankees are champs in my family. There's humor. There's insight. There's obviously a very, an understanding of how it all works. The Yankees are champs in my family. That's like a, you're like, that's like a pun. Like, like you're doing like, just like 20 things in that one yeah. little sentence that show obviously he never missed that his dad was a Yankee fan. Right. He understands exactly what's going on. And, and it basically corrects the story, right? Like, I, let me make a correction. We've yeah, spent hours won. here. Yeah, they won, but the Yankees are champs in my family. Let's go. Like, I mean, it was such a beautiful thing to have be the opening for us because there's just all this family history involved with it. Um, but that was that moment that I knew that, that our life was, like, never going to be the same. Literally never going to be the same. Like, I was... It was, it was surreal. Even for the next few days, I was in a state of like euphoric, like where am I? But it was so beautiful. And we never looked back. That was, that was a year and three months ago.
I have, I have hundreds of sheets of paper of Jamie's thoughts. We've talked about so many things. We've gone back. You know, it's just what you would think it would be. There are so many questions that you have for your child. And you, Lisa and I will sit on the couch with Jamie with the letter board and with a notepad. We'll just ask him questions. Amazing. We'll just talk for hours, like just about everything. Just to hear how he's seeing the world and how he's doing. And it's just a beautiful, wonderful experience. I, I want every parent to have it. I mean, I, I, and I told you, I called you right after I read the book, and even for someone with, a, with children that aren't, you know, on the spectrum, it really made me think, am I asking those questions of my own children? Am I underestimating? This title of the book, Jamie, is so powerful because how much do we underestimate all children? How, how much are we underestimating each other? How little, you know, how much are we assuming communication and not really listening, you know. I remember the part where you, the first time you go into a Chipotle and you get the salad, which you always got with chicken, and finally, Jamie says, I prefer steak. <laughs> How many years? You know. So many years. That must have been torturous, Jamie. I mean, <laughs> um, so Jamie, what is your dream now? What is your dream now? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're doing great. Go ahead. I want to go to college. Wow. Do you have an idea of what you want to study? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. You got it. Mm-hmm. 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 When you get right science. Neuroscience. Go ahead. Yes. Wow. I want to point something out, Dell. When parents first start doing letterboarding, their communication partner is going to be doing a lot of prompting, both with their hands and with their mouth and everything else. And what you can see is that I've faded a lot of those prompts, right? You're just kind of hearing me say, mm-hmm, once in a while, yeah. right? And that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to move to an independent state. But I think it's important for parents to realize it's like training wheels until you can ride a bike, right? There's a process here that's involved and knowing that Jamie was going to be on TV I've really faded the prompts a lot so that people can really get an appreciation for who's doing the spelling and who's doing who's communicating yeah. here but this is um, Jamie has moved through this program at a very accelerated rate and he's at a very advanced stage now and so if you're a parent and you walk into that room for the first time it's not going to look like this this does not happen overnight this is hundreds and hundreds of hours of hard work to get to this point. And, and what you're saying, and, and you, you just had a Zoom call with Mary Holland and several other parents of um, varying degrees of autism spectrum, and some are in programs, you know, um, learning to type and things like that. But what was interesting was you were talking about, I think when you're saying that, most people think, you know, the child has to do all the learning, but there's actually a real learning curve for the parent to be able to work with the, the, the letter board and to work with the keyboard and, and, and facilitate, it, it almost sounds more like facilitate an emotional space with which they can work in where it's calm enough so that they can focus or something. Yeah. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. just trying to, just from what I yeah. heard. I think, I think that there's a risk that a parent would watch this and they'd go put a keyboard in front of their kid and see if they could do it. And okay. if they couldn't, they might conclude, oh, they're not a candidate oh, for this kid. method. This is a complex two-person dance. You're a dance partner. Jamie's a much more sophisticated dancer than just about anybody he works with. Mm -hmm. It takes them time to get up to his level. And oddly, the most important thing that he needs out of communication partner is calmness. Mm -hmm. He can pick up on the anxiety. That's a very hard thing. Telling someone to be calm is like the worst thing for their calmness that you can do. <laughs> yeah. But um, 
I've talked to Elizabeth Vossler about this and Don Marie. They have a confidence that they can spell with anyone. And so when they sit, that confidence comes through, that calmness comes through. I personally possess that now. I feel like I can spell with any speller. And so, yes, the communication partner, which is what I am, really needs to be trained up to be able to help these kids. So if you do an experiment at home and it doesn't work, do not let that dissuade you from giving this a try. In fact, I thought that was really interesting in the book. Like you, There was a frustration you were having that when you would go to the lessons with Don Marie, he's open, he's able to ask questions, and when you're back at the house, all you are getting is the ability to sort of get the answers, the to know, the known answers, but you couldn't, that must have been extremely frustrating. Oh my God, it made me just want to be in Southern California where Don Marie is all the time because we would go down there and get all these amazing things out of him and then we'd come home and we weren't able to replicate it yet and that is very frustrating. Luckily, it was also very temporary yeah. and then we got through that period and now we have Jamie and I able to communicate anytime we want. Um, so yeah, it takes time for the parents to get it. You got to put in the time. So the, the big question, right, and this is something that on the high wire, one of the things that I've been very sensitive about because working with Andy Wakefield on Vax and Polly Tommy and people that had been in this movement have, some of them have children themselves. There was always a concern that was spoken to me, Dell, be careful about giving people hope. Be careful about having cures. Everyone's got a cure. Everyone's got, you know, and what work may work for one family or one child or one stage of the development may not work for someone else. So it's really dangerous to get into the world of cures. It's something that I, I kind of avoid it. I mean, I'll be honest, people come up to me all the time. It's Xenolite or what, you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm sure it works. You know, good luck with that. It's just not what we do on the high wire. Um, so this is really sort of a step out. And, and part of it's because of the work that I've watched in you, knowing you, how to cure the autism epidemic, we we share a way that we see the world and I, and, and your, your understanding of science. And so here I want to very carefully ask the question, who who is a candidate for this? Because I'd be afraid to, you know, in your book you talk so much about the pain of hope, like that one more thing, one more failure, I don't know if I can handle it, and I'd hate to be the person to do that to someone that's watching right now. Yeah. So how does someone figure out if their child is a candidate for this ability, for this talent? Let's ask Jamie. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Come on. Mm -hmm. You got it. Go ahead. I think all kids can go do this. So he said, I think all kids can do, go do this. You know, so I think it's a great question, Dale. Yep. And I understand hope and the toxicity of hope over time. Yeah. I felt it for myself. When I first met Elizabeth Vossler, I asked her this question in a kind of a different way. I said, have you ever had any kids show up here who you discovered were cognitively disabled and therefore unable to do this? She said, not yet. Wow. And so I say, like, when someone has a stroke and they're unable to move a part of their body, because I really think that's the best analogy for what we're doing here. We're trying yeah. to bypass a motor disability. When someone has a stroke and they're unable to move a part of their body, are there any of them who we don't try to get Moving again? <laughs> sure. I mean, um, do some children have more complex motor challenges than others? Absolutely. Will some take more time than others to do this? Absolutely. Do I think it's possible for every non-speaker? I, I mean, I do. I mean, I think about that night when Honey Rinasella reached out to me, mm -hmm. and 
I believed her that these words were coming from her son Vince, that she was sending me these complex words. I did believe her that it was happening for her. But I also convinced myself in that moment, there must be something special about Vince that they just didn't know that they missed. And hey, lucky them. I'm happy for them. But come on. Really? He's going to start like spewing out these complex sentences? It even got to the point that when we went home, I videotaped Jamie on my phone and sent her the video. I was kind of like trying to say like, hey, this is my guy. He's not going to be doing what Vince is doing. And, and Honey did something that I, I hope the book will do for people. She bridged hope for my family because what she wrote back made an indelible impression upon me. She wrote back and said, oh my God, Jamie's doing so much better than Vince. I know he's in there all the way. I know he can do this. And that was like not what I was ready to hear at that moment, but it was almost like I remember reading it and going, okay, fine, I'll call, I'll try this. She bridged hope for parents during a time when they might, might not have it. I get it. I know what it feels like. You don't want to be let down again. I can just tell you our story that I was you at one point and we just gave it a try. Jamie, when he tells that story, is there any frustration about his underestimation of you in comparing to Vince? <laughs> Go ahead, I know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go you got it. You got it. Calls. Calls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, because he called. <laughs> <laughs> no, because he called. Because you got through it. Because I got up the next morning and made the phone call and made the appointment. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So. In one year, in a year and a half. Less than, yeah. Less than, we've gone from openly communicating. So you go back to the school and then, is there work to try and figure out where is he actually at now? I mean, we know his reading and cognition are there. Where is the math at? So yeah. where did you start at? Did we start in fifth grade or 10th? I mean, where were we, what was the, how did we go about that? As soon as he was able to communicate, he was communicating at a really high level. Yeah. And he's in an autism school, so it's not as simple as fifth grade versus sixth grade. Yeah. And so he was put in the highest academic classroom in the school. Um, it turns out that math was something that he really understood at a very high level. Within a year, he's tested out of high school math completely now, so he's done with math. So we're talking algebra or? Algebra, algebra two, trigonometry and geometry. So he's all done with those and he's. No way, I didn't even, I'll, I'll be honest, Jim, I haven't even got through trigonometry. <laughs> he, he's tutored in calculus outside of high school because they don't really offer calculus at his autism school. Um, and he's doing, he's doing great. And so yeah, we're filling in the gaps to see if there are gaps. There are, there are sort of like, no one ever gave him U.S. history, right? Okay. Right? So there's not an aptitude gap. There's just a content gap. And so the school is methodically sort of filling those gaps. And he'll, you know, he'll graduate from high school being a little bit older than the average high school senior, mm -hmm. right? Because we, we want to fill those gaps thoroughly and get him prepared for college. Um, but there's not an aptitude gap. And so it's just really a matter of time at this point. So it's sort of interesting. The learning is age appropriate. Maybe some of the content was missing, so you just fill in the content. Jamie, do you know or remember when you learned to read? No. This is a funny one. I didn't know Jamie could read. No. And he was able to tell us that normal sized font in a book is too small for him and it's kind of is moving all over the page. Because right, one of the things is their eyes are... He's got ocular apraxia. As soon as we can take a book and put it into like a 20 point font letter, he'll sit there and read the whole thing no problem. No one had ever told us that or figured that out before. And so when he has reading assignments in school, now they blow the book up for him, put it in a form that he can use. 
And so when we have assignments on reading, I just basically like turn the pages for him because he uses his finger to kind of track. But he'll read fine and then he'll answer all the questions perfectly about the content. So when he says he wants to study neuroscience, that's in his capability. I mean, he's somewhere between every bit as intelligent as another 18-year-old and maybe 100 times more. And we're not sure where on that continuum he is. And, you know, in Jamie's case, Jamie identifies as a non-speaker, not as someone with autism. Autism is a word, right? It's a word. Right. You can be in college <laughs> and have autism, yeah. and you can be in a mental institution wearing a helmet and a diaper and have autism. It's just a word. It's not a word that works for Jamie. What he says, I am a non-speaker. So I think it's important that, I think that people still struggle like, like, do you really mean that he's cognitively normal? Like, is that what you really mean? And, and then it's like, yeah, like, I just think he can't speak. I think that's it. He's got a motor disability that we call autism, but inside the brain is working just like all of ours are, except for this motor planning function. I remember, you know, a couple of things. You were asked about Jamie, just why, why are the movements, you know, why, why the um, stemming? And, and I'll paraphrase it, but he basically just said all kids move all the time, move lots. Only autistic kids get in trouble for their movements. Yeah, yeah, I was really, I was really struck. I was really struck when Jamie said that, right? And you paraphrase it pretty well, like, like, all kids move their bodies. Only yeah. kids with autism get in trouble for moving their bodies from their ABA teachers. So let's just tackle ABA for a moment. Yep. This is a white hot topic. You'll find parents on all, and, and the problem is ABA doesn't just look like one thing. There's modified ABA, light ABA, whatever it might be. I think the problem with ABA is that the fundamental pre premise is that the kids are not capable. And so we have to modify their behavior so they can kind of like survive in society. And so when your fundamental premise is maybe wrong, that's a real problem. Um, what I can tell you is I react to ABA not firsthand, but based on how I hear the non-speakers talk about it. I think their voice matters the most because they're effectively the consumer. You know, in the case of Jamie, he found it to be dehumanizing, okay, and really, really frustrating. And he felt that most ABA teachers who he interacted with were mean-spirited at the end of the day. It's very hard for me as a parent to hear. Um, I've also met parents who feel that ABA like saved their kid and really helped. I think, again, we need to reevaluate ABA through the lens of the presumption of competence. And presumption of competence is this beautiful mantra within the world of S2C, mm -hmm. which basically means presume they're highly intelligent right. and then behave accordingly. And I think if an ABA practitioner presumes competence, probably even the way they do ABA is going to change. And if we recognize the movement disorders that our children are dealing with, there are probably parts of ABA where they really ask for like, them to conform with their bodies that are kind of cruel. And I think we need to listen to the non-speakers, some of whom are suffering from PTSD, some of whom have a really hard time with ABA, to hear what their gripes are about it. Maybe there's a middle ground there, I don't really know. Before Jamie became fluent on the board, I didn't think twice about it. I figured that ABA and the autism school, they all knew best and they were trying to help my son and I would let them be the experts they were in this area. And then all of a sudden I get all this feedback from Jamie who says, I really didn't like that. I really did not like being treated that way. I didn't like being asked to do those things. And um, it's caused me to reframe. Every time I talk about ABA, I get really mixed feedback. Some people get really angry about it. Um, I'm not saying to throw everything out. I'm saying we need to relook at it. We need to talk to the non-speakers. Don't talk to me. Talk to the non-speakers who are having to endure this and figure out if there's a better way. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You got it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> People are going to like this. Go ahead. You got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it is mostly cranial. So, um, 
he, he's spelling, I think ABA is mostly cruel. Mm. Mm. I, think, I, think that, um, I think that's going to be really hard for some people to hear. You know, I don't like to speak for Jamie, but when he says, I think ABA is mostly cruel, that's his experience in his school with his set of teachers, and it needs to be heard. Just to the, a step further, there are these, I mean, I don't, so what are the, ABA is one of the techniques, but there's several techniques to teaching or training autistic children, and they're pushing back, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're pushing back against this narrative that, that what this book is about, what Jamie, why Jamie and you set out to write this book was so that people would know this exists. Yes. But there are people that we have looked to to be the authorities on autism mm -hmm. that are refusing to accept this story, this narrative, and that this is possible for children. Is that correct? Absolutely. And what they say is that Jamie's not the one doing the communicating, it's me. That this is sophisticated ventriloquism and nothing more. So they reject that it's the voice of the child and they actually try to frame it as a human rights violation, if you can believe that that it's not the child doing the speaking. And they, they just want the conversation to end right there, right? But the next step after what you're witnessing with Jamie is the children independently type on the keyboard. They don't all get to that point, but plenty of them already have. At that point, I don't know where you go to refute that. So I'll be honest, I'm, I've sat here, right? I mean, I can read a book, I can think, you I mean, I trust you. But as I watch this experience, there is, you would, there is no way any, any person with brain cells working in their head could watch what is taking place here and say, Jamie's not doing that. You know, I can see that there is a connection between you, that there's a, there's a confidence that exists that seems to have a team experience, but you're not moving the board. I don't see a board moving around. I don't see the letters being put and what I see is, and it's really more in the eyes, the way Jamie, especially in this situation, tracking from the keyboard to what he's writing. And then as soon as he hits that delete button one more time, Jamie, I think you just proved it right there, right? You can watch the letter being spelled out. When his hand goes over, hits that delete and goes back, that's, that's it. That's the end of any argument anyone would have, yet that argument is going to be there. That is their argument. That is literally their argument that it's not him doing it. And so um, I think it's silly. I think it's embarrassing for the people making that argument. I've yet to make, I've yet to meet one of the persons making that argument who's ever sat with a child spelling. Do they just refuse to go in the room? Are there Absolutely. people that just refuse to look at it? I won't even... Uh, you know, Elizabeth Vossler put it best. Once you sit with a speller and witness it, you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Do my eyes deceive me? Or is this telling me something very new about autism? Oh. Even within Jamie's school, the BCBAs, the people who are ABA specialists who've given their life to ABA, have never borne witness to Jamie's spelling. They will not sit in a room with him in his own school. I guess I have mixed feelings about that because as we were talking before this, in everything that we're doing, in all of these extreme situations now in this world, whether it's the COVID pandemic, masking, PCR testing, science, all of it, everyone just, in my experience now, and maybe even myself, suffer from a religiosity to everything we do. We are just so, as a species, it is so hard for us to accept that we have something we need to learn. Right, that my I was right. I've put, I've invested in this. I'm not changing. And this is I experienced this is when I worked at the doctors. One of the things people always said, "What did you learn coming out of the doctors the most?" That science and medicine doesn't advance barely at all. In fact, the true pioneers are only attacked. Their license is always under fire. Every time I found what I believe were true miracle workers, we don't celebrate that in the society. Human beings don't celebrate that. We try to tear it down. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, but this is already spreading like wildfire. I mean, this, no one really, I mean, and I know it was out there. How long had, or let me ask you this question, how long had S2C been around prior to your 
and, well, and Jamie working with it? S2C had been around for six years, okay. but RPM, which is a cousin of S2C, had been around for 20. Mm -hmm. I'd heard these stories, but they weren't, they, they just weren't delivered to me in a way that allowed me to understand. Mm -hmm. I didn't have this appreciation for this absolutely radical view that this is a motor planning disorder, not a cognitive disorder, that every child is fully there intellectually and every child can be taught to do this. That's a very different frame from the one that I understood it to be. And so I discounted it heavily. And it's part of why we wrote the book. I just wanted parents, especially parents in, in my world, if you will, biomed parents, to understand the journey that we went through and how this reframing of what autism is, this radical reframing, this beautiful, amazing, wonderful reframing, we had to go through as a family. And once we got there, the whole world opened up to us. Um, it is a radical reframe. It's very hard for some people to accept. It's very hard for some people to understand. They're gonna have to sit here and somehow rationalize what they're witnessing with Jamie Spelling right now they're, to convince themselves this still isn't true. And I, I, I feel for those people. I understand you've explained this kind of cognitive dissonance and binary thinking that our world, world, world is filled with right now. Mm -hmm. So be it. The tidal wave's coming either way. Yeah. Parents aren't gonna stop. As soon as you taste the truth, as soon as you start to see your kids spelling, as soon as, what's gonna happen is people who've read this book, they're gonna start having experiences just like I had. And they're gonna remember that they read about it and they're gonna to start to go, oh my God, and, and it's those, really happening. And, and I understand the parents that are, I can't imagine. I mean, I've always said, you know, when people say to me, Dell, the sacrifice you made or the energy you put in, I say, if you've ever spent one day with a parent of an autistic child, then the, I've, my life is easy. And I understand after years and years of that just being worn out. And I think that I'm hopeful that already this, you know, S2C is being overwhelmed. They can't teach teachers fast enough. The book is, is you've, started, you've started a wildfire. Uh, Jamie, congratulations. You know, you have, you've lit the world of non-speakers on fire. You've, you've set a fire that is going to change the world. How do you feel about that? Go ahead. I'm proud. Mm, you should be. I'm you proud should of you, buddy. be. Just, just, just. And I think those parents that are worn out, it will only be a matter of time before someone very close to them gives them that call. And yeah. they hear it from the right voice and say, it worked for me too. Here, here's what I can tell you. I, a bunch of the families at Jamie's school, they got called by a teacher who's no longer there and told not to try this, that it was dangerous. And so months went by and we didn't understand why, but all these families were not giving this a try, despite us kind of sharing all our information and where to go. Then we got wind of like what had happened. We said, okay, let's just take a different tact. We knew these families personally. We said, just come over, mm -hmm. just come over. Dell, it took two minutes. They didn't understand that he was communicating fully, that you could sit here and have a conversation. I don't have to, you asked Jamie a question, I don't have to repeat it for him, he just gives you his answer. They didn't understand, and as soon as they bore witness to what we were really talking about, they were done. Yeah. And so, hopefully more families who are still on the fence, don't wanna hope, will have a family nearby of a speller, and they'll have the chance to go bear witness for themselves, and for some, I think they'll need to see it for themselves to really believe. I remember reading your last book, which was an amazing book and, and encapsulated so much of the work that we've been doing with our team and scientists and specialists. At the end of that book, you talk about Jamie, the dream that maybe he could read the book you just written, that he would understand what you had written in that book. And within what, two years? You sit in this moment, it's, it's a miracle. I mean, it's like you said a prayer. I, I know. I think about 
I can still remember writing that epilogue to How to End the Autism Epidemic where we're hiking in Hawaii, right? Yeah. And I'm hoping someday, somehow, some way, and I, to be honest with you, Del, when I wrote it, I don't think I really believed it was possible, mm. right? But it was, I was, being, I was being vulnerable. It was something I really, I really thought. There is so much irony. <laughs> mm. I can't, when I did the audio version of the book, Jamie was in the room the whole time because I happened to have like a four day span where I had to do it and he didn't have school. So I just physically brought him with me. He knows every word of that book. <laughs> he <laughs> understands every word and did the whole time. There I'm writing, oh Lord, could you please someday maybe have the ability for him to understand? He can probably recite the, every page. And, and to think that um, two years later that I'm here, it's not even within the realm of being able to understand how that all happened. And I'm, I, I feel like the luckiest guy on the planet. I really do. I really, really do. I, I, from the day of the Red Sox, when Jamie talked about the Red Sox and the Yankees, every day has been a good day since then. Every night, I thank God that I'm here, that I have him the way we do now. It's changed everything about our life. The darkness has been lifted completely. And I'm not the most religious person, but I got to tell you, it does feel like prayers answered. And, and I said for a long time when I was doing all this activism and taking a beating and all these arrows in the back and everything else, I didn't feel like the trade with the man upstairs was working very well. Like here I am struggling so much at home with Jamie, but trying so hard to help other families. Like we're even, we're good. <laughs> we're good now. Like we got, I am square. Like we are square. I am so thankful and so grateful. Jamie. All those years, 17 years or so, waiting for your, your parents to know the truth that y you were in there, did you always have faith that they would figure it out? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yes, they never gave up. Love you, buddy. The book is underestimated. It's a great interview. I want to thank everybody that made that happen, JB, Jameson. But there is no interview that can do what this book does. So if you're out there, I don't care if you have an autistic child or you do not. This read is something spectacular. Uh, it's put out by Skyhorse Publishing, Underestimated an Autism Miracle. It truly is pages filled with a miracle right before your eyes. If you like that clip, then be sure to check out our live broadcast of The High Wire every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific time. You can watch it on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, and Twitter. We'll see you there.